so anyway, my name is Dr. Mary Ann Trevor. I'm a naturopathic doctor in practice here in Airdrie. I have a practice in Calgary as well. And I teach for um, a botanical medicine company called POSCO. And I'm an editor, associate editor of our national journal called Vital Link. And I do work for the College of Naturopathic Doctors of Alberta. I actually serve on our Complaints and Investigations Committee, which is, uh, you know, I don't talk much about that. <laughs> I can tell you, usually colleagues is like, you don't want to be on our radar. <laughs> but I, I'm here today to talk about hormonal health. Um, it's a thing that there's a lot of talk in the media. There's a lot of marketing towards women uh, between 40 and 60. But I'm here to tell women that it's not just an issue of menopause, that, that hormones actually um, help our body adapt to changes and stresses throughout life, and we don't, in fact, need to medicate a lot of these changes throughout life. Okay. So we're going to do a, a quick overview of the female hormonal system, boom, water skiing tour. So um, the big two hormones that, that handle uh, that govern menstruation are estradiol, which is an estrogen, and progesterone. So sorry, we're going to get the get the marital gals. Okay. So these are the hormones that, that really govern menstruation, and they're both secreted by the ovaries. The other important ovaries, and I've got a bit of a typo there, follicle, you'll see, excuse me, on tests sometimes, um, something called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, that's a bit of a typo on the slide, or luteinizing hormone. Those are actually chemical signals given by the brain that tell the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone. DHEA and testosterone are androgens or male type hormones that are secreted by our adrenal glands. Women have them too. We also use them now in much less quantity, but we, we use them and need them for a feeling of well being, for bone health, and also for libido and our sense of uh, often women with low chronic stress have low DHEA and find that they are losing their memory. So, cortisol, the stress hormone, it's the hormone that helps our body adapt to various stressors, whether it's pain or temperature change or emotional stressors or traffic or all of those other things. So that's a, a quick slide <laughs> of how it all works. The hypothalamus is an area of the brain. So I won't, don't worry, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. It, um, it's the master thermostat for our hormonal system. The anterior pituitary is a tiny part of the hypothalamus. It's in the, what we call the brain stem. And it is the, the the part of the thermostat that, that tells the other organs, such as the ovaries, in the case that we're looking with female hormones, what to do. So this system has checks and balances and positive and negative feedback loops. Growing follicle, uh, so in the ovary, a growing follicle is, is produced using estrogen and under the governance of FSH. So estrogen actually increases, so our estrogen is peaking right before ovulation, so estrogen is is the hormone of the first part of the menstrual cycle. In the second part of the menstrual cycle, when the egg is secreted from the ovary, there is something called a corpus luteum, or a yellow body created. That, and then progesterone starts to govern that part of the cycle. And here, in progesterone is where usually the problems come in. Progesterone is often not secreted these days in adequate quantities to maintain a proper menstrual cycle. It happens at the beginning of, of our menstrual life, during menarche, in the first couple of years afterwards, and definitely in perimenopause. And progesterone, increased progesterone itself, inhibit the secretion of FSH and LH. Don't worry, it's not, a, it's not important to know all these things. What is important to know is that we only produce one egg because adequate progesterone serves as a feedback loop to tell the brain not to produce any more eggs. So again, another complicated slide, but what it, what it, basically the important thing to know about hormone formation is that they are all formed from cholesterol. So this becomes a problem for many of my women patients that are vegan or don't eat meat. Is it's hard for their bodies, hard for their livers to produce enough cholesterol, and we often have hormonal problems mm -hmm. from those patients. But the important thing, again, the important thing to know is that progesterone actually is produced on a completely different pathway than estradiol, and that will become important when we're talking about stress and the way that it can dysregulate estrogen and progesterone. So even more complicated slide. <laughs> so this is this is the whole big picture of where this is all produced, and the various enzymes and inhibitors, and that is so not <clears throat> important to know. But it's just there to tell you that it is a big. If you could go to the next slide, it's a big, big symphony of hormones and feedback loops and positive loops and negative loops. And so the point is, when a young woman, say a 14 or 15, is given the pill to regulate her cycles. 
there are downstream effects on this complex system that can't generally be planned for. It's one of the reasons that I often see women in their late 20s, and they've been on the pill, say, since they were 16, and now they're having trouble getting pregnant. They've come off the pill, they're six months off the pill, and there's been downstream effects from, from all that use of suppressing ovulation. So estrogen, so the big one, that the hormone that everybody hears about is the hormone that companies will have you believe is the cause of menopausal symptoms. Um, there are actually three main estrogens produced in women. So the estradiol, again, that governs menses. Estriol is produced during pregnancy, and it has a lot to do with the strength of the pelvic floor and what we call urogenital health. So we actually sometimes, um, now I can't, as a naturopathic doctor in Alberta, I can't prescribe estriol right now, but when I was in British Columbia, for many years I prescribed it for women that had a lot of vaginal dryness issues, often women that had had hysterectomies of one kind or another, particularly for women that were at familial risk of hormonal cancers, we would prescribe them estriol, and, and it was often the thing that saved their saved their bladder health. Estrone is that thing we all curse about. It's the estrogen that is stored in our fatty tissues, in our breasts and our hips. It's the we have that there for a good reason, and that reason is we need a storage form of estrogen so that we can maintain a healthy pregnancy even during a period of, of lack of food. So there is a, a good evolutionary reason why our bodies tend to maintain our fat stores and why they're difficult to lose. That storage form of estrogen postmenopausally becomes our main form of estrogen. So interestingly enough, it's often my extremely slender women that suffer after menopause and say that their skin is dried up and they're, they're having trouble with vaginal dryness. So sometimes it's almost better to put on a little weight in their forties. I know it's tough. It's not what a lot of us want to hear these days, but but you can actually um, those women that are that do have a little more fat actually maintain their bone health a little more and maintain their their brain health a little more because they have some estrogen stored in their fatty tissue. So what, they, what the main function in reproduction of estrogen is to thicken the uterus for the implantation of a fertilized egg. Levels, of, as I mentioned, are higher during ovulation. You'll hear it referred to, you'll see it on labs, it's follicular phase. And that means the ovary is getting ready to produce an egg, a follicle. Um, it has other receptors, many other functions in the female body. Rising levels are critical for, for menarche. And I know these days, we're seeing a lot of young women going through early menarche, and there's a question whether that has a lot to do with estrogens in our food supply and estrogens in our personal care products. But I'm definitely seeing it in my practice, 10 and 11 year olds, higher rates of obesity in young girls, and definitely girls getting their periods at 10 or 11, which is not so good. Um, so it, it maintains healthy levels of cholesterol, which you need to form all of your hormones. It supports breast and female fat storage, so what we call secondary sex characteristics. Bone health, particularly, that's really important is to build good bones during our, our teens, our 20s, our 30s, and our 40s, and uh, maintains healthy pelvic floor. So good. a lot of my postmenopausal women will complain about often bladder urgency, bladder irritation, sometimes prolapses of one kind or another, and good healthy levels of estrogen actually help maintain the strength of those tissues and, and maintain healthy intimacy through our 50s, 60s, and so estrogen, up and down and up and down. Female hormones, male hormones are kind of like an on-off switch. So you've got testosterone, dehydrotestosterone, testosterone switches on, switches off. Um, with women, our hormones are a little more like a fancy Italian sports car. They are a thing of beauty when they work. And the cycles help us maintain pregnancy and health throughout, throughout our lives. This is often the trouble with estrogen comes in often through the first part of the cycle when it's going up, when it's up and down, and then again at parity and menopause. But one thing I do tell women going through the later stages of menopause that are really struggling with it is that the new equilibrium that we have post-menopause is actually quite lovely. <laughs> it's um, women report to me that they feel much calmer, they feel more in control, and they don't feel quite as see as they have during those periods of fluctuation and perimenopause. So despite what the media will have you believe, there is life, there's plenty of good life after menopause. The balance of estrogen and progesterone during a woman's hormone uh, menstrual life, so between about 13, 14, and about 50, now that can range between menopause, can range between 45 and 55. But during that period of a woman's life, the balance of estrogen and progesterone shifts during the menses, as mentioned before. 
um, estradiol levels fall, and that they're the ones that, when women complain specifically of hot flashes and brain fog, that's often from rapidly declining estradiol. We see it, the worst cases I see are women that have had hysterectomies. Sometimes they, they have hormone levels completely crash within the six months to a year after they've had their surgical procedure. In fact, I had a woman in my clinic recently who had ovarian cysts and heavy bleeding, and they, they did a hysterectomy and the heavy bleeding stopped, but she still is having ovarian cysts. So often surgery doesn't completely solve the problem. Um, progesterone, very important hormone often, and, and has been classically overlooked in the gynecological literature. It's produced in women by the ovaries and the adrenal glands. It's again produced after ovulation. Classically, PMS symptoms, so it's that heavy, heavy breasts, feeling um, irritable, cranky, painful, that's often because the body's not producing an adequate level of progesterone. And there are a lot of reasons why that's so in the modern world. Um, its function is to support the implantation of the fertilized egg. If the conception does not take place, progesterone levels will, will drop sharply during your menopause. So women that have what we call luteal phase defect or early periods or they're bleeding for a long time, they often have problems with progesterone. And it is typically the hormone I see out of sync in, in a woman's early 40s. And often the hormone that's out of sync in, in girls 13, 14, 15. Um, progesterone, besides being essential for pregnancy, it is the pregnancy hormone um, and normal menses. It, it also has a lot of other functions in the body and one thing that a lot of women aren't aware of is it actually has a critical, it's a critical component of bone health. So women that have PCOS, for example, and aren't ovulating, aren't having regular cycles, are, are often losing bone in their 20s and 30s. It balances estrogens. Now, proliferative means that it grows breast and uterine tissue, but, as, but progesterone balances it off. So it actually has an important protective function against over production of, of, so basically happy menses, but it also has a very important protective function against growth of breast tissue through the women's 40s and 50s, very important anti-cancer function. It increases blood flow through the small vessels, so women with lower levels of progesterone tend to have higher blood pressure and vice versa. I've actually, in the past, I've prescribed progesterone to bring down blood pressure in some patients in perimenopause. Not that it's the only thing it's doing, but, and this is important to know that it's a difference between natural progesterone and the progestins that are in drugs like Provera. They actually have an opposite effect on blood pressure. So they will, women on conventional hormone replacement therapy have to have their blood pressure watch quite carefully, whereas natural progesterone is usually good to lower, lower blood pressure by about 10 to 15 points. So significant difference between the two of them. And, and one of the main reasons why I really don't like the use of oral contraceptives for women over 35 for hormonal irregularities because it's just not it's just not the best option. And it, it increases not only that, but taking um, artificial estrogens orally increase the risk of clots. And that can be very worrisome and very significant for a woman over 40. So the last one is kind of in a really important one too. Progesterone modulates the effects of excess stress hormone on the body. So one of the things that we, we know stress hormone tends to increase insulin, tends to push women towards being insulin resistant and diabetic. And I see this in a lot of my a lot of my 40, 50 something patients that are sandwiched between the, the needs of their growing family. So their children that maybe their late teens or early twenties, maybe boomeranging back and forth between job and home, maybe looking after aging parents is often, that's the same time that they're going through menopause and progesterone levels are dropping, stress hormone levels are going up and it's bringing their blood sugar with them. So maintaining a healthy level of those sex hormones through menopause actually helps keep our blood sugars down and help us keep our weight off. So these are common conditions of, of estrogen progesterone imbalance and these could read like a list of the most common female disorders, period. We're seeing more and more of prolonged menstrual bleeding. Definitely, I'm seeing much more polycystic ovarian syndrome. I, I've been in practice a little over 10 years now, and I, I saw this occasionally early in practice. I've seen it quite a bit now, and I'm seeing quite a bit in younger and younger women. Um, fertility problems, we're seeing more of this these days, and there's 
there's a lot of, um, not all of it is, is from poly polycystic ovarian system syndrome, or PCOS is the most common reason that women have fertility issues. We're seeing more and more problems with men with sperm counts as well. And again, this is actually, this is, could be a whole other talk. This is an awful environmental, because we're seeing a lot of estrogens in the environment. So migraines, hot flashes, totally estrogen progesterone imbalance. Progesterone often drops in a woman's late 30s to early 40s, and you can you can double or triple that if there's a lot of stressors. Anxiety and insomnia that I see in a lot of my 40-something women, again, estrogen, progesterone imbalance, very frequently. I actually will often treat anxiety that appears in a woman's middle 40s, or like I said, you can't prescribe progesterone now, but in the past, I've actually given prescriptions for cycle progesterone for that. It's worked better than a lot of the, a lot of the common antidepressant medications. So you hear the term estrogen dominance. That you know, you'll notice how much this list looks like the last list of estrogen progesterone imbalances. So when you hear you hear the term estrogen dominance, what that means is that the estrogen is not balanced out by other hormones. Now it can be progesterone, it can also be DHEA and testosterone as well. If these don't balance out the estrogen, you end up frequently with very heavy menstrual cycles, PMS, migraines, irritability, that sort of growliness that a lot of women in their 40s complain about, and a, and a lot of menopausal symptoms. So isn't that interesting? We've been, we've been led to believe by the primary people that menopausal symptoms are all about estrogen, and they're just not. Um, so they can appear in early adolescence, and I, I see this quite a bit, and I, it's one thing that I tell families, and I lecture about over and over again, is that there is really no good reason to put a 14-year-old girl on a pill. There is no good reason. There are other ways to balance out, and better ways to balance out their hormones. The same that as a, as a parent, I mean, <laughs> when I was in my training, it, it gave me a fair bit of pause that I was asked to, yes, go ahead. That I, I was, I would be asked to prescribe these medications for young girls, and I felt very uncomfortable with the idea because I, I just didn't think. And now I, I have the evidence and understand that it really isn't about that. Yes, the pill will regulate cycles, but it regulates cycles by suppressing ovulation, which is, this, which is the very thing you don't want to do in a woman that's starting her, you know, starting her menstrual. So estrogen levels, and this is another important thing, estrogen levels themselves do not have to be high to cause estrogen dominant symptoms. I see this in women frequently, the, progest the progesterone is just flatlined out. So insulin resistance is another thing that we often see with polycystic ovarian syndrome, definitely with menopausal symptoms. It can cause, because, because of the insulin resistance, it raises testosterone levels, so women will often complain of acne and weight gain, it suppresses it. Testosterone also is in equilibrium with progesterone, and testosterone and um, high insulin will depress progesterone, increase estrogens, stop ovulation. Women, so that, like I said, that what they'll complain about is weight gain around their midriff. They'll complain about that they're skipping cycles, and often infertility results. Um, thyroid disorders, particularly hypothyroidism, and again, this is one area where NDs and MDs often dissent with one another. Um, I believe that, that there are a lot of subclinical hypothyroid conditions in women, not necessarily best treated with hypothyroid hormone, but they do need to be recognized. And one of the things that I do in practice is I'll have women take their temperature and I'll look at what is your temperature when you get up in the morning and if it's consistently 34 or 35, then likely you have a thyroid. Even if the, the testing says, oh, your TSH is fine, you're fine. If your morning temperature is 34 or 35 degrees, no, it's not fine. You may be producing thyroid hormone, but it's not getting into your cells. So this is an often, again, overlooked cause of infertility, and particularly of miscarriage, is thyroid disorders that aren't recognized and aren't appropriately treated. Again, they don't necessarily have to be treated with medication. Medication for hypothyroid disease tends to be a one-way street in that once you prescribe medication, it's very difficult to get a patient off it. So there are other options for bringing up thyroid hormone. Cortisol, good old cortisol, stress hormone. Um, it, it in and of itself bumps up insulin. It can cause thyroid problems in and of itself. Like I said, these, these hormones are a symphony and they all, they all either play together or they try and play over each other. Um, it also 
excess cortisol decreases progesterone. So you're starting to see how stress, like stress is just like sticking a screwdriver into the hole. You know, putting a screwdriver into a motherboard, it just, you, you get just all sorts of downstream problems. Um, chronic stress, ins insomnia, anxiety in themselves, again, these behavioral things cause excess cortisol. Feed, cortisol and estradiol that are actually the only two hormones that have what we call a positive feedback loop. So high stress hormone bumps up estrogen. Estrogen bumps up cortisol. They all they both feed into insulin. It's a it's a bit of a nasty loop that one. Melatonin, on the other hand, increases progesterone production. So it's one of the reasons I actually use melatonin in some of my late forty something patients <coughs> to help them sleep. High processed food diets definitely increase stress hormone, increase insulin. High carbohydrate diets. Women over forty, one of the things that I teach them when they say I can't lose weight is that the, the dietary needs of your children, particularly if they're between, um, say, 5 and 15 or 16, they need to eat a much higher carbohydrate diet than you do because they're growing. Women over 40 need to look long and hard at the grains portion, particularly the grains and processed food portion of their diet, and the sweets and the sugars because they're often, they often feed into this forward loop that ends up, even if your caloric intake is not that high, the insulin signaling will cause them to put on weight. Long-term use of, of oral contraceptives, I have seen this over and over and over again. They increase yet another hormone called sex hormone binding globulin. It, it's sort of the hoover of the hormonal system. It eats up excess hormones, but by suppressing uh, regular ovulation, it's, it's often very difficult to reinitiate ovulation and regular menses afterwards. And I see this particularly, and it's something I find very concerning about young women that take the depo provera shot. As I have seen it many, many times, these young women will put on 40, 50, 60 pounds on this shot. And it can take up to six months to um, help the body detoxify those progestins out of the body. I've seen a lot of, a lot of very severe side effects from that particular medication. Um, so why do women have so many problems with hormone imbalances? Well, one is one is oral contraceptives, definitely. And I'm not negating the need for family appropriate family planning. I'm just saying that I think patients need to be informed that these that these drugs don't come without risks. You know, and we need to be informing our patients that really there are there are plenty of there are other methods to use for family planning if we need to do it. It's fertility awareness, as IMDs, as different options that patients have that they may not know about other than just taking a pill. However, that being said, there are many other hormone disruptors in our environment these days. One of the things we know, for example, is that there are now oral contraceptives in the drinking water supply of a lot of, a lot of major cities, Toronto being one, Seattle where I trained being another, Vancouver being another where I began my career, because these drugs are not filtered out. <laughs> they're not filtered out in sewage treatment and they're dumped into our rivers and oceans, and that's one of the reasons one of the reasons that we're seeing lower fish stocks in uh, places definitely in Vancouver and in the Salish Sea. Um, flame retardants, also solvents, plastics, pesticides, um, heavy metals, we have pesticides in our water supply here and around Calgary. Um, and many of these act as estrogen mimicking compounds in the environment, and I don't see that to a lot of people. You know, we, we just, we live in a modern environment, and I don't think anybody would want to go live in a cabin in the woods, but we do need to be aware that with industry and with plastics and with things like flame retardants come chemicals, and that it is important, if you're having any health concerns at all, to look at some of these things in your environment and look at some of the choices you're making, for example, in personal care products and in some of the food that you're eating. So many of these compounds interfere particularly with estrogens because they mimic them. Some patients are at a higher risk of hormone disruption, and these are the patients that end up in my office. So nurses, very frequently nurses that work ICU, OR, ER, those, those nurses are exposed to a lot of, of carcinogenic compounds. A lot of, a lot of the antiseptics and anesthetics that are used in hospital settings are actually what are very bad for women's health. Um, cosmeticians, a lot of the perming solutions and color solutions I know. I go to <laughs> an Aveda salon, which is supposedly supposedly uses non-toxic dyes, and at the chair next to me is a woman having a hair treatment with covered in saran wrap, and uh, saran wrap, 
um, that is, I don't even know that is my phone. Um, saran wrap is, um, has a particular plastic in it, a phthalate plastic that makes it soft, and it leaches estrogens into the environment and into the for women's hair. Um, low doses, now this is something very interesting from public health research that's been done over the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of which, interestingly enough, is being done at Simon Fraser University in BC. But they're telling us that low doses of these pesticides and plasticizers actually exert just as or more potent effects of higher doses. So we all are exposed to this stuff. We just, what we can do as women is make different choices, for example, in personal care products and also in our, our definitely our, our, our cosmetics and our hair care products. Testing for hormone levels. I do have a lot of patients ask me about this, whether they should do saliva testing. Now I do saliva testing in my clinic. Um, Often when we need, we need data, if there's been, for example, if there's been um, a hysterectomy and the patient is having severe symptoms, then we need to know which, how far off the hormones are. Often, to be honest with you, though, I think that you can, when you take a, in my clinic, when I take a long, I mean, I'm usually doing a 40 to 45 minute history, good physical exam, a good history should tell you most of what you need to know. I'm not a fan of having patients spend a lot of money on private testing because I believe that most of the time, given that a lot of the disorders, you saw how many of the disorders were due to estrogen progesterone imbalances, given that most of the time we know that short cycles mean less progesterone, we know that hysterectomies that mean less progesterone, you, you can treat without needing to do a pilot testing. That being said, there are, there are quite a few tests that are helpful to detect hormonal disorders that you can get out through Alberta Health. And I do, I do encourage patients to get these done under the system that we all pay into. So um, again, FSH, LH, and that will, those two hormones actually go up during menopause. So they will tell the physician or a naturopathic doctor like me at what point in menopause a given patient is in. DHEA, again, the androgen produced by the adrenal glands, it's sort of our, our get up and go hormone. Um, if we talk testosterone the same, or get up and go, or libido hormone. Hemoglobin A1C, I probably should have spelled that out. That is an average of blood sugars over a three month period, and that will tell you how your insulin, how your insulin or insulin resistance is doing. Um, thyroid disorder is very, very common in women these days. We, I do like to look at all of the hormones to see what's going on within the cells, not just what's going on in the brain. Prolactin. Uh, yet another hormone, this actually is the, the hormone of um, <clears throat> milk production produced by the breasts. And it is also part of those same feedback loops with estrogen and progesterone in the brain. S cortisol testing can reveal problems with cortisol balance of the stress hormone. In, in young mothers, for example, I often see when I do four points, so I'll do breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. Frequently I'll see it go shooting up first thing in the morning because when we get up and to look after our kids, get them to school, get them to work, and then it crashes. So I see that pattern fairly frequently. They can be helpful when people are really depleted. Most of the time, when people are mildly depleted, again, history and physical exam, because I'm working a lot with botanical medicines, history and physical exam tells most of what I need to know. I'm usually testing my, my, my really ill patients. So these are some of the conventional therapies that everybody's heard of, and I, I certainly, you know, I took the pill when I was in my early 20s, and I was really married and not, not wanting to start a family right away. Um, mostly um, oral contraceptives are prescribed in women under 40. They're sometimes given during menopause, and, and that's really, in my opinion, quite problematic because of the risk of clots with these oral estrogens. And not only that, but we're seeing risk of serious clots in some of the newer pills for example, I don't know if anyone in this group or anyone online heard about the problems with Yasmin. It was a pill that came out about 10 years ago, and they were seeing some, I think they saw a couple deaths with Yasmin. And we were told, you know, when we went to our continuing education events, oh, this was a great pill, it was wonderful, it was fewer side effects, and then we started hearing about all these adverse effects. So, yikes. I mean, to me, that's just, a, I, I don't know how they got that. That is an unacceptable risk for someone to have a serious medical event from a drug like that. I am convinced that, I am convinced, and I'll say this again, that oral contraceptives are not necessary for balanced cycles, that they should be used for contraception and contraception. Um, 
um, there's really questionable evidence that they even work in adolescence because they're working really only by suppressing ovulation. They're not working by inducing normal ovulation. They have adverse effects in many women. I have women come in to me and say, I fell psycho on the pill. And my doctor said, that's very unusual. No, it's not. No, it's not. I mean, I see this quite a bit. Um, so standard hormone replacement therapy. This is Premarin and Provera. Um, my, I work in my Calgary clinic with a family doctor. She was telling me stories about how, I think it was 20 years ago, the Premarin people sponsored a, sponsored a zoo day, a zoo day and spa day for women family doctors in Calgary. So all paid for. So And then they had to listen to little talks about Premarin. So this is how the game used to be played <laughs> before, before people started noticing that the drug companies were kind of gaming the system. Um, but, and the, the women's study, the women's health study that came out of Boston University and uh, Harvard showed that there was actually increased risk with the combination of Premarin, which is a, which is horse estrogens, a mixture of horse estrogens, and Provera, which is an artificial progestin, um, that they caused, uh, actually increased uterine cancer. That's, I mean, that's significantly increased the risk, of increased by 120% in five years. And they also induce risks of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. Guidelines are now so that the most current guidelines, which guidelines are really expert opinions by doctors, they're not really they're not really the same kind of evidence you get from large trials. But but guidelines seem to be driving a lot of things in the conventional world these days. Um, they're now saying that you can use them for severe symptoms two years or less. I have never. I was um, in British Columbia for eight years. I don't think I gave one prescription for Premarin. I only gave one prescription for Provera, and it was very short term. It's for a woman who was having extremely heavy menstrual bleeding and needed to slow it down. And we used Provera for a couple of months, and then I switched to, to progesterone after that because the option was the other option was hysterectomy. <laughs> so, so in that, it, in my opinion, is really the only way we would use Provera. It's very short term for a specific urgent situation with extremely heavy bleeding. I just don't think, I don't think these are necessary. Even, even for severe menopausal symptoms, you just don't need these. Um, bioidentical hormones, you'll hear more and more of these. Almost everybody knows about Suzanne Summers. Almost everybody knows about, you know, that there are clinics in town where you can go and get prescriptions for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, the whole, the whole schmear of hormones. They are produced in the lab, so they're human identical in that the chemistry is the same as the hormones our body produced, but they're not completely natural. So it's important to make that distinction that they're, they are lab produced hormones. And there is also no consensus amongst experts about what is the appropriate level to give patients. So what you'll often see with the quote unquote anti-aging docs, and I've seen this a few times with women, they'll come in and they're on levels appropriate to a 30-year-old, and they're in their middle 60s. And I, there just haven't been really good safety studies done on long-term use, spe specifically of estrogen and testosterone. We know that progesterone is a safe hormone long-term. We do not know that, even about bioidentical estrogen, even about bioidentical testosterone. Well, there is no evidence in the literature, and, and they have been used in Europe for a long time, symptoms and for hysterectomized patients. There's no evidence that they increase risk, but there's no evidence that they're completely safe. So that I do explain that to patients about the hormones. Um, progesterone and prometrium, which they, they can be prescribed by a medical doctor or nurse practitioner on their own, can be helpful for severe symptoms. And I will often refer patients to my colleague in office down at SAGE to, uh, again, heavy bleeding in particular. Um, they can also decrease blood pressure, part of the tools that we use to decrease blood pressure, so we're not the only one. Um, again, no long-term safety studies. They're by prescription only in Alberta right now. Naturopathic doctors are in, we are in talks with Alberta Health to get prescriptive authority, but at this time we don't know who those talks are. So I work with a family doctor when I feel that patients really, really need hormone therapies. Um, again, we, we talk about this a lot in naturopathic medicine, treat the, the matrix of the problem. And when I talk about matrix, what I mean is whole body health. So the brain, as you've learned, is an important an important part of the whole symphony of hormones. It's not it's not just some, some box up there where we think and feel. It actually helps 
set up our body systems to adapt to various changes in our environment. Gut ecology, um, digestion, anybody who's who knows about my work or knows a patient or is a patient of mine knows that I prattle on about gut health and having an important the importance of gut ecology to the metabolism of hormones to our global body health to our immune system. Really, really key is good digestion, good diet, good elimination, um, liver and kidney function again. <laughs> that's not a medical term gummed up, but a lot of a lot of women with um, high levels. I, and I see this a lot. Now. My oil patch guys are some of the sickest patients I have. The ones that go up and work on the rigs, they come down and they've got. I I had um, a gentleman patient in my Victoria practice years ago who was a gold miner in the Northwest Territories, and he had levels of lead and mercury in his body I had never seen. And he had um, early symptoms of dementia in his 30s. So this stuff, if, if the liver can't process these things in our environment, it stays in our tissues and it can be quite problematic. So mitochondria are, are little, they're little tiny organelles within cells that produce our energy. And there's more and more information out there on the internet, more and more studies being done on the critical importance of these little tiny organelles to create the energy within cells and giving us a sense of well-being. And a lot of the, a lot of, talking about the, the endocrine disruptors, the heavy metals, they interfere with the function of those little energy, little energy factories within cells. Immune system balance, very important again, um, allot having to do with can the body fight off normal colds, flus, infections, or is it busy fighting pollens or cat hair or dog hair or other things in the environment? So good healthy immunity, not too many, not too many antibody, the antibody part of our immune system, but good what we call innate immunity, having that system balanced well is very important to health and also to hormonal health. Mind body issues having to do with do you feel comfortable in your own skin? Do you have good relationships in your life? Are you part of are you part of a community where you feel cared for and respected? Those are important features to health as well. Do you have sleep problems? A lot of women in their 40s and 50s come to me complaining they can't sleep because they have a partner who snores. So that is also an important thing is it does the patient, are they having good seven to eight uninterrupted hours of sleep per night? Uninterrupted is important. And hormone imbalance is that's definitely, hopefully at this point, we've, we've got a good idea that that's part of the game. Um, so there are natural treatments. What I tell women is that with botanical medicines, there's certainly over-the-counter products, but the amount of herbs that I can get for patients and that I use to treat are usually much, much higher than the things you get from drugstores. So they'll come in to me and say, well, I tried this product, and usually it's some version of EstroSense or EstroSmart or one of those over-the-counters, and they said it had chase tree in it. Well, not much. <laughs> A lot of the over-the-counter products, they'll say, proprietary amounts, meaning we're not telling you, so who knows. Um, but I do know that the chase tree or vitex onus castus is a very, very effective botanical medicine when used in an appropriate quantity in the right patient for PMS. It can take two to three cycles to work, but it's very effective. Vitamin C is also helpful, but I usually recommend it in a calcium sorbate form. So these are other Smilex and Damiana are other herbs that I use. Um, lowering es es estrogen levels, I will often use a compound called DIM. It's a broccoli extract. It supports the liver metabolizing estrogen, so they're turning this fatty molecule of es estrogen into, into a, um, a molecule that can be secreted in the urine. It also decreases circulating testosterone in women, so for young women that have acne or women that have acne problems, it's very, very effective. It stimulates detoxification systems. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, product for women at risk of breast cancer. So um, really good for women that have familial risks. There's, there's good data for DIM extracts for actually protecting breast tissue. High fiber diets, again, this is something anybody can do, is increase, and, and I don't mean metamucil, I mean green leafy vegetables, flax seeds, um, things that are, you know, orange vegetables that are crunchy, not over cooking your vegetables, but eating them raw when you can. I mean, not everybody can eat a high raw food diet. Some people get terrible indigestion from that. But high fiber diets, the way we used to eat 100 years ago before we had all these packaged foods, these help bind hormones in the digestive tract, carry them out of the body. 
they increase good, so they help gut ecology to help immunity and to stop inflammation in the gut. It decreases it decreases inflammation. Again, green leafy vegetables, orange vegetables, flax seeds, some of my favorites. Um, phyto, you'll hear again in marketing materials something about phytoestrogens. They act, they tend to act as mild estrogens in the body because they do bind to estrogen receptors in bone, in the uterus, and the ovaries. When it's plentiful, it has a weaker effect, so it tends to decrease the effect of estrogen in the body. When there's little, no tissue estrogen, it, it binds to that receptor and increases the effect. So you'll hear a lot about soy. Now, I have very mixed feelings about soy because a lot of it now in our food supply is genetically modified. My problem with genetic modification of food is that the proteins that are produced when you change DNA in the food supply are just a little bit different. And so when I test for food sensitivities, which is the test I run most frequently in my practice, I am seeing soy come up almost as often as any other food. I'm seeing very, very common sensitivities to it now. Not only that, but I, I don't think that those of us, people who are, women who are East Asian ancestry have, they have inherited enzymes in their gut to digest the soy. Most of the rest of us don't. And so often what I see in a lot of women that maybe have Caucasian extraction or South Asian extraction, when they eat a lot of soy, is they end up with hypothyroid symptoms. So that can happen if you're doing soy shakes, soy bars, soy, you know, you, you're doing all these processed soy foods. In addition, things like soy milks and soy bars, the way they process the soy takes all the fiber out of it, and it ends up being an almost carbohydrate, a very like a very high glycemic index food. I just don't. I think in the mommy it can be a healthy food in small amounts for a lot of women, but these processed soy products, the way that were around 10 or 15 years ago, are really not that healthy. Um, red clover, you you find them in in um, spring mixes, sort of clovers are in there. Pea family, so these are lentils, lentils, chickpeas, other things are they're common part of Mediterranean and South Asian diets. Um, hops, believe it or not, <laughs> good old hops act as a phytoestrogen. So, um, and flax, and I, I love the, um, I tell women the golden flax is actually, they, they complain about the taste of the dark flax, but the golden flax has a slightly nuttier, sort of pleasant flavor, and I tell women, buy it in seed and grind it up and stick on your salad. Um, there is some concern in the in studies, and these are, again, um, these are mostly mouse and rat studies, but there there is a caution about particularly about soy for women that have the genetic mutations. So these are the BRCA mutations, and most women that have them know about them by the time they present to my office. If they must avoid estrogens in the diet, I usually tell them to avoid soy. And this extends to women that are first degree relatives of a woman who has had breast or ovarian cancer. And I'm one of those women, so I do not eat soy in my diet. Um, again, I, I mentioned the genetic modified form and the importance of eating it in whole food form with the fiber intact, not in a bar that's been processed. And who knows? Who knows what relationship it bears to the original plant? So these are sort of, you'll see these in a lot of formulas. These are kind of my top three. Um, uh, plants that I use. Black cohosh is well studied for hot flashes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so it's one of those ones that is kind of an individual thing. It's often in formulas. Um, Dong Kwai, or it's a Chinese herb or called Angelica sinensis in Latin. Um, it helps in formulas for endometriosis. I've, I've seen it in formulas. I've used it. Very helpful. You have to be a little careful with Dong Kwai um, if there's heavy flow. So women will often come in, try to formula with it for heavy bleeding, and said it didn't help. Well, that's why, because <laughs> it had that ingredient in it that actually thins the blood a little bit. Um, tree tree again, progesterone-like effects, so very, very good in formulas. It takes, it takes a bit of a while to work, but it's, it's very useful. Um, St. John's wort, believe it or not, good old St. John's wort that we use for, for depression, very effective for, for mood problems, mild to moderate mood problems. It's my go-to herb for almost anyone with with depressed mood or anxious mood. Um, really helpful for the mood swings of menopause. You do have to be careful with St. John's wort because it does interact with many medications. So I tell patients if they want to consider it, we need to make sure that I know exactly what medications they're on. Because it actually increases the metabolism of them. So it, by increasing metabolism, it lowers the volume amount of that particular drug. 
red clover or trifolium you see in formulas most of the time. So wild yam, I have a bone to pick about wild yam. It is not a hormone. It does not have a hormonal effect. It should not be in products. <laughs> it's, it's in products. I don't know why it's in products. It doesn't modify hormones. If it does anything, it may have a fiber content, but if you're doing wild yam cream thinking that it's going to have a progesterone-like effect, no. Just no. <laughs> That's just marketing nonsense. Um, so I use quite a bit of these. They're called bioregulatory or low-dose homeopathic medicines. I use them quite a bit in patients. I get good, good results with them. They can rebalance hormone systems in more than one direction. So the Germans really excel in a lot of these products. There's a number of different companies that make them. They're best done under the supervision of a professional. Um, and they work really well and really quickly in a lot of my patients. No concerns with medication interactions. I use them a lot of times to lower inflammation in, through menopause because the hormonal imbalances are often tied into inflammatory changes from stress. Um, I use liver support, I use detox formulas. I really, really love Pasco, the German company. I don't know, I'm using a specific name, but they make a wonderful five week detox. You don't have to change the diet. And I use them a lot of patients. It works very, very well. You just take it water. Um, lifestyle therapies, uh, plant based, low processed food diet. I know I sound a bit like a broken record on that one, but diet does really make a big difference in people's lives. Good bowel function. I we, we NDs tend to be sort of poop doctors, but <laughs> but having good, regular, well-formed bowel movements are an important way of knowing that digestion is working effectively as well. Good quality sleep. I know Ariane Huffington has, has written a lot about this recently. Sleep is one of those things that many of us were eating into um, the last 10 or 20 years, and sleep is so important to reset our hormonal system and feel like we have energy. I know one of the one of the things I often tell women that are feeling very low energy is how many do you watch television late at night? Are you turning on a lot of electric lights? Our bodies are really not adapted to suddenly, you know, having because you think about the effect of artificial light, it's like having daylight. And then we're going from artificial light to no light and expecting our brains to turn off. Well, our brains are not adapted to that. So one thing that I'll often tell patients that are having trouble sleeping is don't watch cop shows at night. Um, you know, read, sit, you know, you may want to have a, a desk lamp or some, a small lamp to read by, but definitely start to slowly start turning your brain off at night. Supportive relationships and community, again, the effects of community are to help our hormonal system rebalance, decrease stress hormone, increase a bonding hormone we call oxytocin. When you're part of a family, a good community, where you feel cared for and respected, and a sense of direction and purpose in life. It doesn't necessarily mean having the, the huge house or the fancy car, but just having a job that you enjoy. And you, I'd be surprised. I know in this economy, people are just happy to have a job. But if at all possible, having something that you enjoy. Um, I could give a quick example from my practice in Victoria. A lot of people in Victoria work for the BC Public Service, which was not a good employer. And people were often hanging on to their jobs for their pension, even though they despised them. And that was often something we needed, you know, we discussed in practice is, well, how much would you lose from your pension for quitting this job that you really despise, that you hate going to, and that is probably making you sick? So, you know, there's, I think having good, meaningful work is one of those things that, yes, for some people that's a luxury, no question about it. We all have to make a living, we all have to put food on our table, support our families. But if there is a way to find meaning in your work, it definitely so good old stress, master regulator of hormones. <laughs> I don't think I, I need to, to go on about this. I think it's it's probably pretty clear by this point. Stress level, it, cortisol does rise in the year leading up to menopause and postmenopausally. And one of the ways that we can help make, keep ourselves from getting heart disease and diabetes is to watch our stress hormone levels, be aware of what's going on with the stress levels, monitor our diet, monitor our sleep. Um, and because it feeds estrogen and fatty tissues and causes just all sorts of trouble. Um, nutrient therapies can supplement strategies. I don't like patients taking 8 to 10 to 12 things a day. It's not sustainable. It's a lot of money. Um, occasionally, I will target specific, you know, if I have a patient come in whose mom and sister have died of breast cancer, 
we may work on a couple of different, we will have her take a couple of different broccoli extracts, make sure that we're looking at the specific ways your body is metabolizing estrogens. But do most women need to do that? No. You know, that's for specific patients. Melatonin can be helpful short term to re-regulate sleep-wake cycles. I'm not a fan of women staying on it for years. Whole, belt, whole body strategies with diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep, those are really the, the core of maintaining health. So I couldn't get a not equals. More vitamins do not equal healthier. <laughs> so what I tell patients, critical, important, take home message. You can't eat a bad diet and take a multivitamin and have an equal out. They just don't. So bottom line, hormones are just the messenger.